Out there on the internet, there are many people who take a very anti-establishment view of the world around us. I like to use this channel to explore some of the ideas that these science contrarians bring to us and look deeper into some of the aspects that uh, many of us may be only slightly aware of. Welcome to I Can Science That. Today, let's look at the Rayleigh Criterion. The Rayleigh Criterion is often brought up in the discussion of distant views and observations where objects in the distance appear to be obstructed bottom up. From the mainstream perspective, we understand that obstruction from the bottom up is indicated by the curvature of the Earth. But if you take a, an extreme contrarian view, such as that the Earth is flat, how would you explain something like that? Enter the Rayleigh Criterion. I'm going to split this into four short videos looking at four different aspects of the Rayleigh Criterion. The Rayleigh Criterion describes a minimum angular size that we'll be able to resolve. And this is a phenomena caused by diffraction. Naturally, that brings us to a question of what is diffraction? Light is a wave, um, and all waves do something called diffraction. Here we have a series of wave peaks traveling in this direction, and they encounter a blockage. The blockage has a gap in it. Taking us back to Huygens' principle, we can imagine that these wave fronts passing through the gap are a series of wave sources. And if we model it that way, it can be shown very easily that these waves will have constructive interference right in the middle. All of those wave fronts will add up. But what we're showing here in the diagram is that the wave fronts from these three points actually create destructive interference at this location. Rather than propagating just forward as a series of lines continuing just shortened lines maybe continuing forward because light is a wave it spreads out and we get this pattern what we have here is a, a, a slit so this is solid on this side solid on this side and a very narrow gap here in between and a laser light is being shined upon that gap and what we see here is that depending on how wide the gap is you get different diffraction patterns. With the widest gap, we actually get the sharpest image. And the, the smallest gap actually causes the light to spread out the most. How about what it looks like when you go through a pinhole or a round aperture? An aperture just means hole, right? Uh, and that's, in photography, that's what they call the the hole inside the lens of the camera that lets the light through. And with, uh, with your eye, we can think of your, your pupil, the, you know, the black part that the light is going through the iris. We could call that your aperture. When the laser is shown through a round hole, we get this round diffraction pattern. It's the exact same pattern we saw with the horizontal or the vertical slits, only because it's a round hole it radiates outward in all directions. The Rayleigh criterion occurs when two separate lights are both passing through the same aperture. If we have two light sources, such as these individual light sources, both passing through the same pinhole or camera aperture, each one will diffract and each one will create that circular radial pattern. And as they get closer together, when they get closer together, the patterns of the two humps, as you will, are going to start to overlap. Now, at this distance, at this separation, um, we can see that there's distinctly two humps there. So we would say that those two individual lights have been resolved. Now, over here, the two individual lights, they add together. When the lights from both sources interfere together, they're going to add. And if they're overlapped like this, it's going to appear to be a single light source. And 
you cannot tell at this point that there are actually two light sources. And the reason you can't tell is because those diffraction patterns have overlapped and added to each other just create one hump. So the minimum point at which you can barely tell that they're actually two separate humps is what we call the Rayleigh criterion. And that's when that's the point when those two things are getting so close together that the that the diffraction patterns overlap and you can just barely tell that it's two separate light sources instead of one. Here is a picture of uh, a pair of lasers being fired through a single circular aperture. And we can see that each of the two individual light sources uh, creates this diffraction pattern on its own, and that the two diffraction patterns interfere with each other, and these are now starting to blend into each other. If we move those two closer together, they're going to start to merge and appear to be a single dot. This is the equation for the angle when that occurs. So this angle, theta sub r, is the angle of separation between the two light sources. If the two light sources get any closer together than that, they will blur together. So that's, that's, the, that's the angle right there. Uh, and this lambda on top, that is the wavelength of the light. The diffraction pattern and the size of the diffraction pattern is proportional to the size of the wave. So lower frequency or longer wavelength light diffracts wider than, than smaller waves of the higher frequency light. So we see that here in the equation. And this down here, the D, is the diameter of the aperture. We saw that in the earlier slides. When we had a small slit, we got a very wide spread of the diffraction. And when we had a wider slit, the diffraction pattern was narrower. So we see this in the denominator there. And this 1.22, and sometimes you won't see that on there, that comes from the shape of the aperture. If we put the, the aperture as just the two slits, then that doesn't go on there. And the, just, just lambda divided by d. What kind of angles are we talking about then? Uh, let's start with the human eye, obviously. Right? You go look at something. Is this a thing? Like, is, Where is this going to have an impact on the human eye? So the spectrum for visible light goes from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers, and I've converted that to millimeters for our convenience. Um, the longer wavelengths are down at the red spectrum, and the shorter wavelength or higher frequency is in at the violet end of the rainbow. So that's the lambda. What about the D, the diameter? Uh, according to uh, ophthalmologists here, we get the range for the human pupil to go from 2 millimeters in bright sunlight to as big as 8 millimeters in very dim light. So if we punch all those in, the maximum range here for the diffraction limit angle goes from 0 0.00005 radians to uh, uh, the largest diffraction limit here would be 0 0.00035 radians. So that's quite the spread um, based on the wavelength and then also based on the pupil diameter. And we'll look at that in more detail in a future video. Before we do, all the observations you're ever going to see on the internet are not coming from the human eye because we can't share our visual images with each other. Instead, we have to take a picture, and that means a camera. The aperture for a camera is adjustable, or it may be set to automatic. Watch out for that. The aperture for cameras is typically quoted in something called f-stop, which uh, you have to then convert from f-stop into millimeters. As an example, the maximum aperture size available on a Nikon P1000, if I've done my math correctly, is about 88 millimeters. So substantially larger than the human eye, and therefore, you're going to get a diffraction limit substantially smaller than what we get 
for the human eye. I want to keep these nice and short, so I'm going to wrap this up right here. If you're interested in this, join me in the next video and I will go into exactly what this looks like when you see the diffraction limit uh, kicking in. See you over there in video number two.